So my name is Dr. Sebastian Shaw, or Seb, uh, and I am a lecturer in medical education here at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, and I'm also the research lead for Autistic Doctors International. So this was a cross-sectional study, which takes a snapshot in time. And in this case, we used an online survey to explore the experiences of autistic doctors, in particular, the experiences of autistic doctors who were members of Autistic Doctors International. Uh, and Autistic Doctors International is, a, is what it says on the tin, really, uh, an international group for autistic doctors started by Dr. Mary Doherty, who is the driving force behind the group and this project. Um, uh, and the group centers around uh, research, education, advocacy and support for autistic doctors around the world. And this project really wanted to provide an evidence base to the experiences of, of autistic doctors as, as the key demographic of this group, uh, but also perhaps provide some evidence in the way of some of the challenges that they might face in workplace environments uh, around the world. So in terms of the findings of this study, there's a few uh, different sub areas that are really important for us to, to think about here. In terms of the general overview, uh, we had 225 autistic doctors complete this online survey. Uh, and they were from a widespread of countries, uh, really reasonably widespread, actually. Uh, but the majority, about 61%, were in the UK. Uh, and the next most uh, common country was, uh, was Australia, uh, followed by the United States. Um, and most, uh, so the average age of diagnosis was uh, 36. Um, but contrary to some stereotypes uh, that float around about autistic doctors, our, our youngest uh, person receiving their diagnosis was three years old. So there were there were, there were a, a, you know a sizable uh, minority of people receiving childhood diagnoses, um, and, and of those who completed the survey, the vast majority are still currently working as doctors. And in fact, those who receive childhood diagnoses, all of them are currently working as doctors, bar one who was just about to start working as a doctor when they completed the survey. And the only other thing that I think is of interest potentially in, in kind of the overview of the of our participants is the specialties they work in. So there's a lot of stereotypes that float around about where we should or shouldn't work as autistic doctors, grounded in false assumptions about our, what our strengths and weaknesses should be centered around the stereotype of autism. Uh, but in fact, the vast majority of, uh, of people who participated in, in this study were general practitioners. The second most common specialty and by far the most overrepresented specialty, when we consider how many people there are in each group, in each specialty, was psychiatrists. And that was followed by anesthetists. So actually, in particular, our two top specialties here in terms of the prevalence, they were both very highly relational specialties uh, centered around strong communication skills, uh, empathy and, and, and doctor patient relationships, not specialties that are perhaps more commonly assumed to house us as autistic doctors based on stereotypes. Next section that I think is important to think about centers around uh, disclosure of autistic status and reasonable adjustments in the workplace. So Disclosure, core disclosure, came in thirds, which was fairly interesting. So a third of people had disclosed being autistic to colleagues. A third had disclosed being autistic to supervisors or, or line managers. Uh, and a third had chosen to tell absolutely no one in their place of work. So in terms of reasonable adjustments, about half had asked for reasonable adjustments. And of those who asked for them, only half got them. But the half of the half who did get them mostly found them quite helpful. So three quarters of the people who received reasonable adjustments in their workplace did find that they were helpful to their job. So next section uh, that I think is important to include here is centered around challenges in the workplace. Uh, now, stereotypes might suggest certain patterns within challenges that perhaps weren't evident here. Uh, so th there certainly were challenges experienced and reported as part of this project. Uh, most of these actually centered around uh, judgment from or attitudes of colleagues, uh, line managers um, and other people in the workplace. So, so people they work with, not patients. So most people experience challenges from that point of view. 
But actually, when asked about challenges communicating with patients, it was only a fifth of respondents that said that they'd ever had any challenges in that area. So most of the issues that they were facing were actually centered around relational issues with their colleagues and their, and their seniors in the place of work, uh, which is interesting when we look at just how different that is to the challenges with patients. Uh, so something interesting may be going on there um, that requires further research in the future. Really interesting area in this study is that centered around participants' views on autism itself and autistic people. So most participants preferred to be called autistic doctors, and that was in preference to things like doctors with autism or doctors on the spectrum. So they preferred something called identity first language, including autism as part of our core identity. So an autistic person or an autistic doctor. So most considered autism to be a difference. And about half considered autism to be an identity and or a disability. And uh, perhaps not surprising for myself as an autistic doctor, but maybe surprising uh, more generally, is that only a tenth of participants uh, considered autism to be a disorder. And that's particularly important considering that we've all been trained and supposedly are supposed to be practicing within the medical model uh, where autism is still framed as a disorder. But now I want to talk about some of the mental health based findings that we uh, that we had in this study. And at this point, I think it is important to mention a bit of a content warning because these are rather striking and particularly upsetting. They may not be surprising for everyone to hear and they, they certainly weren't surprising to me, but that doesn't take away just how striking these may be in the, in the fact that these may impact people to hear. So uh, the content warning here around uh, self harm suicide, both around thinking about suicide and attempting, uh, and uh, more broadly around how this relates to other experiences. So in terms of mental health findings, half of our participants had engaged in self-harm. A quarter of our participants had attempted suicide uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, this doesn't, the study cannot know how many people uh, sadly uh, have died by suicide that wouldn't have been able to take part in the study. And really strikingly, over three quarters of our participants had considered uh, considered suicide. So thinking back to what I was saying earlier about uh, views on autism as a disorder, only being the minority of our participants, one of the really important findings here was that considering autism to be a disorder was actually associated with having attempted suicide. Uh, and it's not possible for us to know which way round that is, whether that was that people have been indoctrinated into this medical model way of thinking of autism as a disorder, and that may have led to some internalized sense of, of shame uh, and mental Ill health, or whether perhaps uh, the, these particular participants had uh, were experiencing more mental health challenges and therefore were more inclined to view their, their, their autism as a disorder. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting finding nonetheless uh, that requires more teasing apart in future research. Another important finding was an association between uh, self-harm and reasonable adjustments. So this was, there was a significant statistical association here uh, in, in that the people most likely to have experienced self-harm were those who were, were uh, had requested reasonable adjustments, but not subsequently received them. So there was something about needing adjustments to your workplace, which is mandated under the law, um, let, let alone morally mandated, um, asking for them and then being told no. Those were the people who were most likely to have experienced self-harm. There were also some interesting associations around disclosure and, and mental health. So participants who had uh, disclosed to patients were actually less likely to have engaged in self-harm than other people. Again, it's not possible to know which way round this is. For example, maybe these people chose to disclose to patients because they were experiencing less in the way of mental health challenges, or maybe the act of disclosing to patients allowed them to unmask and be their truly authentically autistic selves and therefore led to less experiences of mental health challenges. But again, due to the study type, we can't know that for sure, which way around that will be, but it's an important area for future research. 
Another important finding here was that participants who'd never worked with another colleague that they suspected of being autistic was associated with having considered suicide. And I think, again, that's a really important finding. Whilst we can't assume causation, so which way round that might be, it's really important one to explore in the future. And it, it's possible that it may well relate to some form of uh, feeling isolated. Lastly, around these associations, I think it's important to note here that choosing to disclose to no one at work, which was a third of the participants, that was associated with having never engaged in self-harm and having never considered suicide. So the people who chose to not tell anybody did seem to be the people who were experiencing less in the way of mental health challenges. In terms of final points about our results, I think this is all, all well and good and, and all potentially a little bit upsetting and quite striking, but it, all of our findings weren't negative. And I just want to conclude our results section by saying that actually three quarters of our participants actually enjoyed their work as doctors and three quarters of our participants felt that being autistic was inherently helpful to the role of a doctor uh, due to the many strengths that can be associated with being autistic. So in terms of why this study was needed and why it's important, we already know that autistic people face significant barriers to accessing healthcare and that there's a lot of healthcare inequity and changes in life expectancy for autistic people. Therefore, it's important that we try to uh, promote uh, autistic people being members of the medical workforce. Uh, and that's why studies like this are so important. We need to be able to understand the experiences of autistic doctors like myself and so many others to be able to then try and provide better supports and help to ameliorate some of the challenges that, uh, that are experienced, particularly when we see some of the negative mental health associations found in this study. And in terms of really impactful findings more broadly than, than uh, medical education and autistic doctors in the medical workforce, there's a couple of findings here that really support uh, what the autistic community have been saying for a long time. Um, the first one being identity first language, wanting to be called autistic people, or in this case, autistic doctors. So that really validates and supports something that the autistic community have been striving for and saying for a very long time, both in the sense that our participants preferred overwhelmingly to be called autistic doctors, but also in the sense that those who did prefer person first language uh, or doctor, doctors with autism were more likely to consider autism as a disorder, which was in itself uh, associated with prior suicide attempts. So from my personal point of view as an autistic academic and a currently practicing autistic doctor, one finding stands out really, really massively here. Uh, and that is uh, that our study seems to be in support of neurodiversity affirmative view of autism. So considering autism to be a disorder, it came from us in the medical profession and has been reinforced by the medical profession for many, many years. However, what this study shows actually is that in autistic doctors, there seems to have been a shift in that most of us do seem to be considering autism to be a difference, not a disorder. So this is a really positive shift in many ways that shows that, the, that at least autistic doctors have taken on board what the wider autistic community have been saying for decades, really, uh, around neurodiversity. Uh, and that's really key here that that shift has come across. And then the few, the few participants who hadn't made that shift, who could still consider autism to be a disorder, there seemed to be some association there with more in the way of mental health challenges, uh, which, uh, as I said earlier, may, may in some way relate to internalizing a sense of shame or ableism um, from being trained and indoctrinated in the medical model. But more research is needed there. These, that is a, an interesting and important finding from my perspective. So in terms of next steps, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, positive practical changes that could happen as a result of the paper. Uh, and I would signpost people to, to if you're interested, to, to read the paper and explore some of the possibilities there. From a research point of view, there's a few different things. So this was a big study. And this is only one part of the study that's included in this paper. So there's lots of work for us on our end uh, to, to get on top of analyzing some of the data that are left there. For example, looking at differences by country or differences by specialty may provide some further insights, as well as analysing a lot of our qualitative data. 
And in terms of future studies, uh, I personally will be particularly interested in exploring whether masking, so hiding our autistic cells or acting in a way that uh, makes us appear not autistic, uh, I'd be interesting, interested in whether masking may in some way be associated with the, the striking mental health findings here, uh, because if that is the case, that may open the avenue to increased education uh, and uh, hopefully uh, improved support and mental health uh, down the line for autistic doctors. Uh, so to read more about our study, uh, please go to the BSMS website.